Hello, we are today at uh, the Anil Agarwal Dialogue in uh, Neemli and uh, I am Rajit Sengupta, the Associate Editor of Down to Earth magazine and with me we have got uh, Desai sir, Nitin Desai sir, uh, who has played a pivotal role in the climate diplomacy uh, negotiations that, that are happening in the world right now. So the first question I would want to ask is, uh, what was the political consensus or situation like during the Rio period, the Rio summit type? In 1992, when the climate convention was signed, there were countries like the USA who were skeptical as to whether there's a human-induced climate change. And one reason for this is the scientific panel on this IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the first report did not say openly that it is due to human actions that we are seeing this change. It was only the third report, which came out at the beginning of the 2000s, you know, that said that. So, in a sense, there was still a fair amount. The, the, the amount of skepticism publicly mentioned was also quite substantial. That's gone now. But uh, what about the action part of it that you're ending your... The action part of it is where you could say that it's not adequate. Part of the reason is there's one area where there is adequacy. The rate at which renewable energy has expanded is definitely more than what we would have expected. And, and part of the reason for that is the dramatic reduction in the cost of solar power. True. And why has that happened? China. It is China which went in for a huge program on solar power and brought down the prices of solar panels, etc. so drastically. That has made a big difference. But these are not enough to give us the scale of change we require. And uh, if I had to identify one big shortfall, it's the unwillingness to discuss climate justice. Suppose I ask myself, okay, let's forget the past, responsibility of the past. Let's at least look at the future. True. Between 2020 and 2050, according to the scientists, the total amount that governments can, that country, humans can uh, emit. emit of carbon dioxide is about 500 gigatons, gigatons. million tons. Yeah. If I divide that, by the number of people who will be consuming over these 30 years, it works out to one, an average of 1.8 tons per capita per year. So what this means is, given what the countries have promised mm -hmm. on what they will do by 2030, and the point at which they will reach zero, you can accumulate how much they are going to emit over this period, divide it by the, the population, and see what the rate is. Now, if I, I have done that, True. if you do that, You'll find China and USA will have emissions per capita, assuming they fulfill their targets for 2030 and for net zero, yeah. which is four times higher than what they ought to be per capita. India is not too bad. Okay. India will be pretty close to the requirement. You know? One, close. one and a half. Uh, you know, well, it will be about 20 percent, 10, 20 percent more. Above, huh? and so it is very, it will be, India will have it no difficulty to, in, huh? um, in, in meeting if, if there is a global agreement on the 1.8 saying that uh, India should not have any problem in saying yes. Europe is also a little worse than India, but not that much worse. The real issue is the, the two US, big yeah. emitters, USA and China. So this is why failing to agree on the sharing of responsibilities is one of the big weaknesses. We've still not solved it. Yes, we've got more awareness of my actions on renewable energy, energy efficiency. But the big thing we need to do is still not happen. So you were uh, one of the persons who helped popularize the concept of sustainable development. Do you think it has been popularized enough? But it has become a buzzword now. To some extent, uh, uh, one sees in certain areas that people cannot talk of, don't talk of development without addressing the environment. This has certainly happened in energy. Sure. Uh, in, uh, today, no energy investor uh, we'll talk of energy investments without referring to some area. Uh, it will slowly creeping in in housing and things like that. But this integration of environment into development has not yet taken place. But I must also emphasize, sustainability requires the reverse. That when you are doing environment, protecting a forest, you can't do it unless you worry about the people who depend on that forest for a living. Putting up a fence to protect a forest True. and therefore denying livelihood to the people, to the people who ah. depended on that forest product. And we have also safeguarded it for such a long time. Yeah, it will not work. 
So the reverse is also true, that addressing environmental action without worrying about the role that that piece of environment is playing on people's livelihood. So really what we have to do is to go down and ask yourself sustainable livelihood. I would like to say start thinking of sustainable development as sustainable livelihood. Sure. Then you can get support from people. Also a lot of the things we have to do on climate are for the long term. Sure. And I mean, I take for instance sea level rise. The big impacts of sea level rise will be 40, 50 years from now. Now, can I go and persuade somebody living in a Today. coastal town? Uh -huh. Don't do this type of thing. It's very difficult. So try and connect it with today's requirements. Make them the supporters of environmental protection. Hmm? Makes sense, sir. Hmm. Sir, uh, another thing. Uh, do you think the world needs another Rio kind of a... Uh, Not right now. Not right now? The reason is that uh, political atmosphere right now is worsening. We do have a climate conference, so we will meet every year there. And But it needs somebody who is committed to finding a solution. One of the advantages that we had in 2015 in was France really committed itself to finding a solution. And they put in a lot of effort, diplomatic effort, in reaching out to people. And their advantage was they were from a developed country. Okay. They were part of the G7 and everything. So they had more influence. So I'd say that uh, it's possible this will go if one of the countries decides to take a lead. Maybe we can. Maybe now that we've got the G20 agreement on, uh, on sustainability, etc., maybe we'll get there, but it's not yet. So last question, how do you think diplomacy would move in the future? Or what are the things they should keep in mind right now? Diplomacy is also fragmented. The people who represent a country in the environmental negotiations are often different from the people who represent them in the trade negotiations okay. or in the finance negotiations. Okay. What we need is a coherence in the, the external policy of countries, which combines all of these things. Uh, I cannot go to a country and say, everything you do globally has to be only for environmental protection. That will not work, because the other countries don't, don't do that. Most countries, the environment ministry is a very junior ministry. So we have a lot of time to be, yes, we got, it's good we've set up environment ministries, set up environmental organizations, but we still tend to treat them as very unimportant. You know? You know? So that has to change. Let us hope that changes. Thanks. Thanks a lot, sir. Thanks Thank a lot you very much.